Good morning, this is Dr. Rutledge, and I'm going to give you a taste of my talk coming up in Indoor India about the mini gastric bypass too. So give me a second to share my screen. Okay, let's go. Surgery treatment for all diabetics. Dr. Rutledge, also known as the creator of the mini gastric bypass, is back again with the MGB2. So <laughs> this is a modest proposal, I claim. Of course, it's not modest at all. But uh, I'm going to be arguing in favor of early surgical treatment for all diabetics. Uh, hemoglobin A1c greater than 10 or incipient complications. All diabetics are now, uh, based on some of the research you'll see today, um, candidates for early surgical intervention. And that is quite a radical suggestion, but I think you'll find it's uh, supported in, in the presentation today, but we'll see. And uh, <clears throat> the MGB2 is the treatment of choice. That's what I'll try and argue today. Well, just what exactly is an MGB2 before we get back to the diabetes section, what is it? Well, those of you who are uh, skilled surgeons or knowledgeable patients or physicians, you'll remember that the uh, MGB is nothing it's particular. It's a Billroth II gastrogenostomy with a collis gastroplasty. And the MGB2 is also extremely simple. It's a Billroth II, so same as the MGB. But instead of the collis gastroplasty, we use a gastric plication. And so it's very simple, very short, very safe, easy to revise. And um, we think it's a solution to diabetes. <laughs> so stick with me. Let's see and do an MGB2. Here are the x-rays and interop pictures of an MGB2. And so we'll go through that a couple of different ways. So this is an x-ray of an MGB2 patient on the morning after surgery. And uh, you can kind of see some of the things if you're familiar with x-ray pictures of the chest. This is the chest. And this dye here is the dye coming down the esophagus and into the gastric pouch. And those of you who know, it shouldn't be this small. There it is again. There it is again. And that ain't a normal stomach. And uh, so here we start to see some changes down at the base, and we'll talk more about this. And there we see this connection going down. And now it goes out. And so here's kind of the whole string. So this should be a nice big round guy. Here's some air in the uh, fundus, but this is supposed to be a big stomach where you could put dinner. But instead, what we see is here's esophagus, which is, you know, as big around as your thumb or more. And then almost no space here. And then a little in and out. And then we come down to this area. This turns out to be the antrum. And this is the efferent uh, edge of the gastrogenostomy. So stick with me. I think you'll understand it in a bit. And if you're a surgeon, you're probably well ahead and wondering about it still. Same thing again. Again, uh, no filling of the efferent limb, which is good. That means no reflux into the afferent limb. And that's a critically important point. This is that location between the antrum, the upper gastric stomach, and the gastrogenostomy and the outlet. And so you can kind of see that here. And this is then going on to the rest of the bowel and not much has gone upstream. There's no obstruction, it just doesn't go backwards. And that's a good thing. There's, if you're a surgeon with knowledge, you know that can be a problem. So this is just about perfect because a person who eats into this area can't eat much. And there are some other physiologic factors because they can't digest fat or sugars very well either. And so that means they change their diet or they suffer quite unpleasant consequences. So again, esophagus up here, gastric pouch here, antrum down here, gastrogenostomy here, and then the efferent jejunum right here. And that's the same thing again. And now it's emptying. And so here's the normal gut starting off. 
and there's more. That's the gut. Everything is cleared out. It wasn't obstructed. It goes very quickly. And so <clears throat> why delay? Shall we do an MGB first before I talk about all the rest of the diabetes? What is your preference? And I have choices here, but I'm going to go as if you asked me to show you the surgery first. So I said, let's do an MGB2. Well, what is an MGB2? Well, as we talked about, it's a Bill Roth 2, and those of you who are surgeons, you'll know that, and a gastric plication, and I'm sure you're skeptical and wrinkling your nose and things like that. But remember that the original MGB, which is now used worldwide, even though it was also uh, greeted with quite a bit of controversy, to say the least, and a collis gastroplasty. So that was the old MGB, and there's some pros and cons to it, but it is outdated now with the MGB2, and we'll try and explain that. Again, the steps for doing an MGB2 are so easy, it's embarrassing. Step one is you do a gastrojejunostomy. Step two, you placate the stomach in the antrum and you're done, usually in less than 20 minutes and with no risk of staple line bleeding or a leak or death. So uh, it's a pretty remarkable operation. Again, uh, gastrojejunostomy and you placate the stomach in the antrum. That's it. There's nothing to it. Stop me here if you have questions. <laughs> Here's the surgery. So this is looking inside. Those are your surgeons, you'll know. That's the bougie coming down. And here is the lesser curvature where we often did the gastrojejunostomy in the past for the MGB. But we're going to go five, six, seven, even 10, meter, 10 centimeters longer. And that has important implications because the new gastrojejunostomy is here. The old one is there. So now we find the ligament of trites and we run the bowel. We bring the bowel up here to the gastrojejunostomy site on the greater curvature of the stomach. And we're gonna put those two together as a gastrojejunostomy. Again, a trivially uh, performed procedure. A gastrojejunostomy is routine for all general surgeons. And so we put an anchoring stitch there. And again, if you look up here, here's where the old MGB went. And now we're very far down here that lengthens the reservoir and has many good advantages. So this is the location. And then we put an anchoring stitch and then we bring the staple gun in. And now we have a stapled gastrojejunostomy. We close the defect and this is what it looks like. So this is a gastrojejunostomy, a large efferent and a narrow, if you have to have narrowing on the eighth and the afferent side is the right way. So this is a marked improvement on the old MGB. So again, let's look at this. Here's what we got. This is esophagus. And uh, we are trying to make this narrow. We have this connection already. We have the gastrojejunostomy done. So we're gonna plicate, which is just to run a stitch like you're hemming uh, a, a pair of pants. And that causes that narrowing that you see here. This is an MGB the day after. And this is the whole stomach plicated just with the running stitches, two layers. And here we have the afferent limb and the efferent limb. And here's the antrum. And we'll plicate the antrum here. And so this is what we get, which is not much space to eat, a bypass of the uh, distal gastric uh, antrum, the pylorus, the uh, duodenum, and the connection that's designed perfectly for digestion and absorption of fat and calories, you're gonna divert the food away from that, which worsens their ability to digest and absorb fat and sugar. And that's because it's the location where the liver, the gallbladder, the bile, and pancreatic enzymes all meet to digest food. And with that bypass, the Bill Roth II has been shown for over a hundred years to help and sometimes completely reverse diabetes. Okay, one more time. That's the uh, MGB afterwards. Here's our look, esophagus, neostomach, gastrojejunostomy, efferent limb, plicated stomach. Now, should I stop here? <laughs> Wanna ask questions? Well, why don't we see where and how we should apply the MGB2 in my opinion? So, we are gonna point out that there's presently a worldwide crisis, a pandemic equal to the pandemic from COVID. 
And there's an urgent need for solution because of the complications of diabetes, blindness, kidney failure, amputation, heart attack, stroke, and liver disease. And the MGB, we believe, is the cure. <laughs> Okay, let's remember, diabetes is presently a pandemic rate, tragic complications, including death. And recently, Dr. Kular presented his data, which showed that, uh, in fact, uh, low-weight uh, diabetics can be uh, treated and reversed with uh, Bill Roth with an MGB, the original. And diabetes is now, we believe, a surgical disease. All diabetics now are surgical candidates if they begin to deteriorate by our criteria. And we believe the MGB2 is an ideal treatment for almost every diabetic who has serious diabetes. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic and then we'll talk about the complications. We'll talk about Dr. Kular's data, which showed that diabetes for uh, 55 patients who were followed for up to seven years resolved their diabetes and almost all improved in everyone. And now we believe almost all diabetics are surgical candidates and the method is the MGB2, which you just saw. Okay, let's talk about diabetes and the pandemic. Well, I won't say too much because I've got a lot to show here. And so we'll say that there's a worldwide pandemic with the terrible complications, which is not included only this, but blindness, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, and amputation. We say it's time for us to step up and stop this killer. And although we might not be able to what we call cure, we think we can reverse it for five, 10 or longer years after the surgery. We believe diabetes can be viewed as a killer at large, blindness, kidney failure, amputation, heart attack and stroke. And we believe we can stop them. Okay, what kind of tragic complications? Well, the United States, for example, has over one out of every 11 Americans has diabetes. That's 38 million people. Again, the complications we discussed and look at the cost, blindness, 1.2 billion, amputation, 6 billion, renal failure, 25 billion, cardiovascular disease, 100 billion, liver disease, 5 billion. Total direct medical costs is $137 billion annually. And even if you don't take into feelings of compassion for the suffering patients, on cost alone, this is a clarion call. We must attack this soon or our own economies will be destroyed by this disease and its pandemic spread. Now, <clears throat> diabetes is increasing. In other words, it's not slowing down, it's increasing. The projections are in 2020, 10% of the population and one in three adults will be diabetic in the United States with similar uh, results suggested in uh, India as well. The trends and projections that uh, they think there'll be an increase in the United States costs for caring for diabetics from 300 to $600 billion a year. We say red alert, this is a call of action. We need to do something now. The Delta hemoglobin A1C of medicines is grossly inadequate. Medications do not solve our problem. The hemoglobin A1C in the range of 10, 12, and 13 is a deadly indicator of what's to come. And a medication that changes the hemoglobin A1C by one is inadequate by far. You sit here quietly, but we say your house is on fire. We say this is a call of action. The economic burden of diabetes is spectacular. The USA alone has direct medical costs of $137 billion. There is no end in sight. We cannot ignore this crisis. We seek a more effective treatment, especially those at high risk. And we're gonna talk about that. Okay. Well, what can we say about the MGB2 that we just saw? We can say that MGB is shown by Kular and Machenda that diabetes is now a surgical disease. And that is a wild statement, so stay with me. The MGB and now the better, simpler, faster, cheaper MGB2 can treat diabetes. Here's an example. This is a patient who was in clinic here in, uh, in, in, indoor, uh, in uh, uh, Bijan not long ago. A 37-year-old woman, weight uh, with a roughly almost normal 
uh, BMI. So she's a thin diabetic with a hemoglobin A1C level of 15. That's in the deadly zone. She also had hypertensive, hi hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, a hyperlipidemia, and migraine headaches. She was on insulin for the past five years and has been a diabetic for 10 years. She was treated with a mini gastric bypass on 318. Follow up on October 24th on, uh, in 2024, six years post op, her hemoglobin A1C was 4.7. Her triglycerides were now normal. There was no recurrence of her diabetes. She was declared non-diabetic by her family physician and had no complications. She improved her quality of life. Life. She had resolution of her sleep apnea and her migraines and her breathlessness on exertion. Diabetes can be cured or reversed by surgery. And the MGB and the MGB2, we believe, are the ideal choices. Now, I'd like to refer to the research pu uh, in publication from Dr. Kular, Magenda, and myself. And this is a first report of long-term surgical treatment for thin diabetics, okay? 52 patients followed for seven years, preoperative hemoglobin A1C 12.6 and postoperative 6.1. And these were thin diabetics, okay? So what we're seeing here is very powerful and we believe earth shaking and earth changing. Preoperative hemoglobin A1C 12.6, that's in the danger and deadly zone, as we'll see in some of these uh, graphs coming up, and as Dr. Kular mentioned the other day. Seven years post-op, the hemoglobin A1C average was 6.1. Hemoglobin A1C cut in half, that is a life-saving transition and without medications. Here is the outcome preoperatively, and then look at this, one year, seven, two years, 6.7, three years, 6.4, four years, 6.2, five years, 6.1, and even out to six years, 6.1. That is life versus death with this disease. In addition, we can see C-peptide is an important predictor of outcomes in diabetics. When you have inadequate amounts of C-peptide, you have inadequate amounts of insulin, and it can lead to death, blindness, other kinds of organ failure. And we can see that if we can see the patients ahead of time, that we can change everything. Because look at what happens to the hemoglobin A1C to patients who have even somewhat functional C-reactive peptide. We also have this fear among surgeons. Oh my goodness, you can't do a weight loss type of surgery in a thin diabetic. Well, we did a Bill Roth II, which is widely done in thin diabetics. And like the other publications, we found no adverse effects. In fact, the hemoglobin A1C at seven years was almost normal in every single patient, but two, one borderline and one slightly low. Everyone else was asymptomatic with maintenance of normal hemoglobin and albumin numbers. In addition, we looked at B12 levels and B12 levels were worse before the surgery. That is to say, clearing the deadly disease of diabetes improved their micronutrient function. B12 was made better, not worse. Also, every single one of our patients had a normal hemoglobin A1C and, of course, a normal body mass index. So they were on the borderline of slightly overweight, and all but one came back to a normal weight after surgery. So it's, it, it's good news after good news after good news. In addition, we created a model with the artificial intelligence Gemini to predict the cost based on the hemoglobin A1C. And here is the projected numbers. If you look at the preoperative hemoglobin A1C, the predicted cost for 10 years is $2 billion for these patients. After surgery, the predicted costs have decreased to just under a uh, million dollars. And the savings predicted from the, our model is $1.8 billion. That's a lot of money. Maybe that's actually $1 million, sorry. 
<laughs> so estimated 10 year medical cost, no surgery that they would have cost for the 55 people going to attend 4 million 400,000 patients. If they had the surgery, the model predicts the overall cost would have been $1,500,000, a cost savings to the families, to the patient, to the uh, government of $2.8 million for 55 patients over that time period. This is an unbelievable savings, but these savings also are active in the lives of these patients. These costly things are blindness and heart attack and stroke. These are made better by the MGB in these studies. So here's another example looking at the 100% risk of cardiovascular disease. So what we know from the hemoglobin A1C is it is a predictor of heart attack. In our analysis with the artificial intelligence, we calculated risk of heart attack in these patients based on their preoperative hemoglobin A1C. And you can see everyone, 100% had a risk of heart attack, 100%, every one of them. And postoperatively, postoperatively, their risk at this hemoglobin A1C was zero. It takes a certainty of major heart attack to no heart attack predicted. This is a remarkable finding and we think it's an argument in favor of surgery for diabetes, surgery for diabetes, surgery for diabetes, even in, and especially in thin diabetics. So let's summarize here, and uh, sorry for going through this so fast. The MGB and the MGB2 have success in thin diabetics now, have success in thin diabetics. Our experience with the MGB and selection criteria tell us one simple thing, operate early. That's a radical new idea and needs to be shared and, and studied by others. That's our data and it is clear. We think we can treat all ages from minimal to severe thin diabetics. And Coulard's data says that the mean hemoglobin A1C of 12 can be reversed down to a hemoglobin A1C less than seven, which is in the ideal range and also normalizing their body weight. What we know now, the MGB2 and the MGB2 can completely reverse severe diabetes in many cases for more than five years, often off all medications for diabetes. Why? Because of the Bill Roth II and nothing more than that. Now we could go into this now, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and welcome your questions. I can explain why this works and how it works. And it's not us doing anything special. We know now we can stop diabetes. We should now stop diabetes. Thank you all very much. Well, that's it. That's a draft of what we'll be talking about and uh, hope you liked it and uh, comments and criticisms are welcome.